So yeah, this uh, I won't cover all of these topics here, but uh, um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with APRS, um, but that's kind of the uh, the ham radio side of what we do with the balloons. Um, so APRS is really an offshoot of packet radio, and in a nutshell, lets you um, transmit telemetry and, more importantly, position information over the radio. Uh, it's all driven. The locations are all almost always driven by GPS. Um, and for receiving it, nowadays it's all pretty much done with software, uh, sound card modems, um, whereas you used to use a traditional TNC in the past. And that's kind of what that is. Why do I want it? That's ham radio in a nutshell. If, if we're not having fun, then then maybe we're in the wrong place. Um, and this is geared more to people that have never seen ham radio uh, or, or APRS before. Um, and the second point there is we use APRS because we want to get our stuff back. We fly uh, cameras and things like that. And uh, although we do transmit some data, uh, almost all of it is on SD cards in the unit. And we want our gear back and we want our data back. So it, among other things, it's, it lets us get our stuff back. Oh, yeah. And because it's fun. Um, so yeah, this again, this is aimed at people that really hadn't uh, experienced APRS, but the uh, the vision of APRS was a way for um, presenting information in a central location, whether that's like a big war room like we have here or uh, a map for a public service event or what have you. That was an ugly transition. But, uh, and then just a screenshot. Uh, I'm going to jump out of full screen here. I'm just curious um, how many people actually have just a quick show of hands uh, worked with APRS or are familiar with it? Oh, about half and half, give or take. Okay, I don't want to uh, belabor it. <laughs> I think I'll just stick with this present, this view then. Um, so yeah, the, the whole idea was to be able to, to, uh, uh, display information for, in a central location. So for, um, basically for people that are familiar with packet radio, uh, two stations would connect and they would exchange information back and forth in packets. And, uh, there was some error checking. If a packet didn't get through, they were retransmitted and it was, uh, it was from one station to another primarily and also through repeaters. The difference with APRS is it is, uh, they call it unconnected UI packets, unconnected information packets. So they're not, it isn't two stations connected to each other. It's more of a broadcast and receive. Um, and if a packet is corrupted and can't be received, it's just simply gone, it's discarded on the receiving end with the assumption that there'll be some more packets coming that'll fill in the gaps anyway. Um, along with that is the uh, APRS IS is the acronym for it, but the in internet side of APRS. <clears throat> and uh, so a station that's uh, like I have here in the room that you can't see behind the camera, <laughs> it sits and listens uh, on the AP APRS channel and then sends that off to the internet. Um, there, there's a series of servers that aggregate all the information and remove duplicates and so on. Um, and then retransmit it again uh, for other clients. For example, um, one of the fellows that's uh, flying with us is writing an Android application, and it will actually talk to the internet side of things and selectively ask for the packets that belong to our balloons. So his that's how he'll get his data uh, via the internet. Um, there is a messaging side. It's not as common as it ever was before, uh, but essentially you can send short messages through it. Um, the neat part about this is, is the eye gates are smart. So if, uh, if I travel 
Oh, well, I used the the uh, example of going out, flew out to the Maritimes, turned on my radio, and somebody sent me a message just to my call sign. The APRS uh, in IS knows my location, and hopefully the gateways wherever I am say, send me all the messages for stations th that I've heard. And by that, uh, a message just addressed to me comes out wherever my radio is. So it's it's pretty slick that way. Um, again, it's not used a lot, but it it, uh, it can be used for for that. Uh, so we do have repeaters, uh, digit repeaters, digital repeaters. Um, again, if people are familiar with packet radio, it's exactly the same technology. Um, and they're, because it's all digital, it either is a perfect replication of the signal or it's gone. So either packets get through or they don't. Um, and there's some logic about uh, how many hops they can take and uh, uh, some logic about uh, preemptive is their terminology. So uh, some digipeters will be more aggressive with the intent that they're probably hearing something far away and they want to get it sent into a central uh, location like the city. Uh, whereas other ones are a little more lax and they wait and, and uh, hold off for a moment before they repeat things. But uh, yeah, it's it's really not complicated. Um, the digipeters we have are uh, typically um, old mobile radios with a hardware TNC hooked to them. So, uh, and they just sit there and repeat. And as I said, the eye gates are just a computer with uh, RF to internet uh, connection. <clears throat> now, just with voice, just like with voice repeaters, you can you have to be careful how many uh, RF digipeaters you put on the air, um, because uh, there's only so much bandwidth to deal with. But uh, with eye gates, especially receiving, I always tell people uh, it's impossible to have too many listening in an area because it's uh, what you what you receive is just going onto the internet and it'll all get deduplicated and aggregated by the servers anyway. So the more uh, receive eye gates you can have in the world, the better. Uh, eye gates can also transmit back to RF and that's where you have to be careful. Not too many. And this was just eye candy. That's a picture from the top of uh, one of the elevators south of town. Uh, where we, we no longer have a repeater there, but we used to. Yeah, there is such a thing as an internet-only station, but, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> replace all of that with a cell phone now. <laughs> and, yeah, that's basically it. A radio, a TNC that's part of the sound card now, and it goes to the internet. And optionally... You can have a GPS or some other location device hooked to it. Um, some stations, like the radio that's just above my screen here, um, my house rarely moves, so uh, it's just hard coded in there. And you can have a dedicated uh, hardware that uh, is only for, uh, in this case, a tracker that it actually doesn't even receive; it's just transmit only. Um, and for that reason, it's usually very low power. And I will show you, actually, this is from my bench. See if it'll focus well. Um, so that is the radio that we're using. And it I'll just pop it off the breadboard. It's a little VHF uh, transceiver. Costs about $20, puts out, I think this one puts out a watt or half a watt. And that's what we're using in the balloon for our APRS. And coincidentally, that is actually the module that Mike was using for the voice repeater we flew. So if you heard us on the air, uh, it was from a little module like that. So we've gone from great big old radios, like my uh, old Radio Shack one pictured, down to little tiny modules. Um, and yeah, you can use sound coder. Sound cards, actually nowadays sound cards work better than hardware. So uh, that's generally what I use. 
Now that was me attempting to explain the internet, inter, APRS internet system. Um, there's about uh, 5,000 times more of that. So uh, it's just a bunch of interconnected uh, hubs and routers and uh, several databases. Uh, this is just talking about software. There's software for every platform and then some. Um, this again is a little bit old because I do have uh, Palm Pilots listed there and DOS. Uh, I don't know whether the slide is old or I am old, but either way. But uh, if you can imagine there's uh, there's software for anything. Um, and there's a few of them that are cross-platform that uh, it's kind of nice. Once you get used to using it, you can use it on uh, on different platforms as well. There is uh, a couple of these links are old, uh, but uh, what you can do is run web only, which is when we were flying with the university students, they were tracking it uh, uh, via web page. Uh, they did actually have a radio in one of the vehicles, uh, receive only, um, but uh, APRS.FI is probably the, the best one to get onto. Um, and this bottom one that says tracker.habhub.org, uh, I just heard that at the end of the month, they're shutting that down. Um, it's out of Cambridge, and I guess they're uh, running out of uh, computing power. So uh, there are also some satellites. Um, the one in the top right-hand corner is my favorite. Uh, this was PCSAT. It was launched in the... Uh, I believe in the late 90s. Um, and it was supposed to run for a few months and it's, uh, it's actually still every once in a while springs to life when the solar cells get hit just not, just right. But the reason I like it is if you look closely at the picture, um, what they use for antennas is just tape measure. So they uh, nicely marked already for you, rolls up nicely in the in the uh, canister when they're flying it, and then it just springs out all by itself. Um, and they also have it on the ISS, and I've I've repeated through them a few times. But balloons, that's why we're here. So as, as Nero mentioned, uh, after climbing down a tower one day with uh, my friend Gus, he said, why don't we put a radio on a balloon? And I thought, that's the best idea I've heard in a long time. So the, the next spring we did, um, and I don't know if I have, I don't have a picture on from the web page that I linked in the chat. Um, Sabre One shows some of our antics at the first one. Um, and these are just two pictures of two payloads as they're coming out of this. The, the one on the left is actually Sabre One taking off. And the one on the right, I think was two or three. Uh, we always, our hope is to catch it on the way down, and this is as close as we've gotten. So to do this, um, basically you need to get it off the ground. And for that, uh, uh, barring your friends that are into model rocketry, um, you need a, a weather balloon. We use uh, the latex weather balloons uh, on the ground. They're about six feet across. And uh, at apex, just before they burst, we figured they're probably 25 to 30 feet across. Um, and they just go up as high as they can until the latex can't take it anymore. Um, and they rupture. We started off using helium, um, which was affordable back then. Uh, a few years ago, uh, about seven or eight years ago, the price of helium tripled. And it's gone up uh, even more now. Um, and as of this summer, some of the American uh, people flying uh, can't even get it. Uh, it's it's being rationed down there. So uh, we switched to hydrogen. Um, a tank of helium for us would probably cost anywhere from one to two thousand, one to three thousand dollars. We're not going to do that. Whereas a tank of hydrogen uh, costs about a hundred bucks. So it's a uh, it's a massive difference. And the first thing people think of is the Hindenburg. So um, we did a lot of research on this before we did it. But essentially there's, uh, although it's very flammable, um, once you get it in a balloon, 
there isn't enough oxygen to sustain any combustion. So uh, there's no risk of the balloon itself catching fire. If it ruptures and there's a ignition source there, you will get a fireball. Uh, but thankfully, hydrogen being light and fireballs being even lighter, uh, it goes pretty much straight up. So uh, there is a risk, but it's not an explosion risk, and it's not going to be uh, as bad as uh, as what people imagine. Uh, having said that, we take precautions like grounding our equipment and keeping spectators back and everything just to be on the safe side. Um, we, of course, there's a parachute. When it comes down, uh, the regs say you have to, uh, there's a limit to how fast it can descend. Um, now, once in a while, our parachute gets fo uh, fouled and that doesn't happen, but uh, we do our best. So it's, uh, and this is actually a parachute designed for rocketry. So they, they make really nice parachutes. And everything is uh, powered by lithium batteries. Uh, it, at about between 40 and 60,000 feet, it can get down to minus 60 or more uh, outside. Uh, and all things are in styrofoam, they still get pretty chilly inside there. So lithium batteries are what you need for the low temperatures. Um, and you need a certain type of GPS. Um, the American regulations uh, set out uh, uh, what, basically the limits for GPS for export. And uh, what it says is you, they can't go faster than 500 meters per second, and they can't go over uh, 18 kilometers. And the regulation says they can't do both at the same time. So as long as they only do one, they're legal. But um, a lot of... Uh, uh, GPS manufacturers, it's just easier for them to do an OR. So if it goes too high or too fast, it shuts off or doesn't work. Um, so because of that, we have to use certain GPSs that we know uh, have been tested by either us or other hams uh, to know that they will work at altitude. And there's quite a few. It's just you have to know what you're the, and knowingly look for them. Um, and then you need a transmitter like that little guy that I showed you. Um, and in our vehicles, uh, we run various things. Um, I'm a Kenwood sort of person, so I've got a, a Kenwood mobile and a Kenwood handheld that I uh, track with. Um, Ron, one of the other guys, uh, uses the ASU, um, and Gord is uh, writing stuff for Android, so that's what we use for our tracking. Um, and the uh, the Holy Grail is... Uh, Gord really, really wants to catch this coming out of the sky once. And we've been so very close. But um, so, yeah, there. So, uh, I'll go back to our traditional balloon, I'll call it, which is a latex balloon. Uh, and it goes up and bursts. The not so traditional one is called a floater. And this is a picture of my little. Uh, tracker that I built, I think that was 32 grams in total. Um, it's solar powered, has a small lithium battery on it, um, a GPS, and um, this is something I learned from a fellow named Bill Brown. If you're flying, especially during daytime, uh, all you need is a little bit of uh, plastic to create a bit of a greenhouse effect in there, and it'll keep keep uh, the sunlight will actually keep it well above freezing, uh, at least at at uh, you know jet stream heights. Um, so, and then you tie that to a thirty-six inch party balloon, and filled with helium or hydrogen. Pardon me. Um, and you weigh it so that it has very very little lift. Uh, I shoot for about two grams of lift just enough to get it off the ground um, and what they they call this a super pressure balloon so it'll rise up and the gas in there will expand of course and at 20 to 40 thousand feet um, the envelope doesn't exp doesn't stretch so it'll create a little bit of pressure inside there and it'll lose a little bit of buoyancy and it'll just float um, during the daytime, the sun warms it and it goes up a little bit, to maybe 5,000 feet, and in night it drops maybe 5,000 feet, and it just floats there. Uh, if you're lucky, you can catch a jet stream. If you're really lucky, 
you can do what I haven't yet, and that's get across to Europe. And if you're incredibly lucky, you can be like uh, one of the fellows uh, in the UK who had one flying for, uh, I believe it was 400 days. And it circumnavigated the globe uh, 24 or 25 times before they lost track of it. So a guy can dream. Uh, I've flown three of these. Uh, the first one disappeared off uh, into the North Atlantic off uh, Newfoundland, never to be heard from again. The second one went, uh, took a right turn uh, through the States and uh, landed in Georgia overnight. And in the morning, the sun hit it and it took off again. And then it finally landed in uh, South Carolina where it stayed. And the third one, which was flown the same day we uh, flew our voice repeater, uh, developed a leak and landed in uh, Last Mountain Lake, about 100 kilometers south of Saskatoon. So uh, never to be seen again as well. So that's the floaters is what I, uh, I'm doing more of, a little more now. Uh, there's a lot of work and it's kind of a shame to build that little tracker up to know that you'll never see it again. But uh, the whole tracker itself probably costs Forty fifty dollars in parts, if that. So it's it's not a huge expense, but it's kind of fun. Um, and oh, I'll just stop there. Uh, primarily, we run on VHF, although there are uh, some UHF bands or some activity on UHF, but it's not a particular frequency. Um, and uh, there is some on HF as well. Um, on VHF, it's 1,200 baud. Uh, UHF is usually 9,600. And on HF, it's down to 300 baud. And I think primarily on 30 meters. And then there's just one little thing that, <clears throat> that we have to watch out for uh, when we build these floating international balloons is uh, that we stay legal. So my tracker has uh, geofencing code built into it. And as it travels around the world, fingers crossed, uh, it'll change frequency or it'll actually stop transmitting. Um, for example, it is illegal to uh, transmit airborne, uh, ham radio airborne uh, in the UK. So if it's over the UK, it won't transmit. Uh, there are a few other less than savory places in the world that you don't want to ever transmit over. It's illegal or incredibly foolish to do so, so it doesn't transmit there. And in other cases, it just, like it'll switch over to the European frequency and then there, China has a different one, Japan has a different one, and it'll, it'll do that as necessary. And this just talks about, um, the way the tracker is programmed governs how many hops it'll take. Um, if, you, if you're uh, on the ground, uh, you may want a couple or three hops to get a small signal into, or a weak signal into a central station that can get it to the internet. Uh, if you're flying a balloon, um, you've got an incredible range. So you, you usually have, sometimes I put one hop in there just for, for good measure, uh, but that's about it. Any more than that, and you'll have people uh, calling you up telling you why you shouldn't do it. Uh, just a few of the other things that APRS can do is, uh, uh, one of the things is dead reckoning. Uh, so if you lose a station, it'll it'll plot its last position and course and estimate where it's going. Um, and also you can use it for uh, fox hunting. You know, I've tried it a little bit. It's, it's hard to coordinate, but several APRS stations essentially transmit a special beacon that shows a bearing from their location and the map mapping software uh, cross, crosses all the lines and gives you a location of the fox in theory. Uh, there you go, fox hunting, I knew it. <laughs> and this is actually something else you can do is you can plot stations. Um, so this, uh, G4 IDE was a developer in Britain that wrote one of the, the UI view, UI view software. Um, 
and uh, he passed away in, I think it was 2004. Um, but basically what people around the world did was on the day of his funeral, uh, each ham that wanted to participate uh, signed up to take control of one of these little dots. It's a, it's a position object. And out in the Atlantic, they spelled out his call sign. So uh, one of those dots is mine. I forget which one. doesn't matter. But uh, you can do some really cool stuff like that. But yeah, that's that's my quick and dirty presentation. Uh, yet, as I say, I'm, I'm more of a tinkerer. Uh, so I like building the stuff. I like flying balloons. I like uh, it's the chase is like a giant geocache. Um, and APRS is just a handy, uh, handy tool that lets me do it. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it it's kind of the the standard for balloonatics, as we call ourselves, uh, for doing it via ham radio. But uh, yeah, I'm open to any questions people might have. Bruce, are there no uh, no connections with U of S there? Because I mean, I know they used to do some high altitude research and stuff like that, and there's always engineering students getting into stuff and. Uh, actually, we do have one. Um, it's it's actually a program run uh, between the U of S and uh, RMC in Kingston, and um, we've flown with them twice. So the uh, what our last flight before COVID was with them, and our first flight after COVID was with them. Um, See, so yeah, that's a, a grad student class that uh, uh, they are given two weeks to design and build a payload and uh, we fly it for them. And uh, so it's a, hmm. yeah, it's, it's a fun, fun project to watch those guys. Um, there is an awful lot of work done with uh, high altitude stuff, but the, the prof that's doing it, he's got a, a really well, it's a really mature uh, process that he has already uh, all his own equip equipment and it's, uh, it's commercial stuff. But uh, yeah, I used to work there, so um, I do know the people anyway. Well, that's great. Yeah, they uh, we always get a few people that are, you know, doing some projects. Wise, we we got a young lady in the class. She's doing a grade twelve project, so I'm I'm hoping she'll stick in there and get her ham ticket so she can do some more building and stuff because it serves a it's a great way into the into the hobby and the business. Certainly is, yeah. Uh, Brent, yeah. Good question. Brent? Yeah, I, I noticed that um, the containers you had, you said styrofoam. So are those like one cubic foot styrofoam can, uh, coolers? I will just get one for you. Let's see if I can get this here. This is just made out of, uh, I believe that's half inch styrofoam. And this is my tracker that lives inside there. I have a, a question. Um, you mentioned um canadian regulations as far as the size of your balloon uh can you put multiple small balloons or how does that work in case one has a leak or bursts right um their regulations are a little vague um it's a single paragraph and it says uh a, it a balloon envelope no larger than 162 cubic feet at liftoff. And that's all it says. Um, so if you were flying two, uh, they'd have to add up to 160 in there, if you read it that way. Um, and people have done that. They have flown multiple ones. The problem is um, if one bursts and the other one doesn't, and now you you may have accidentally created a floater or something that will descend very slowly, um so yeah and you know lines tangling and so on um and latex weighs an incredible amount once you add it up too <laughs> so everything's a matter of just every little gram counts are there regulations where you can't uh release them like in a city or something or does it matter um actually not really uh we work with transport canada and nav canada uh and uh, so we fly actually about four kilometers from Saskatoon Airport, which is within a zone that you normally, you can't fly like drones or anything like that. Uh, but as long as we notify them and coordinate through them, uh, they're just fine with it. Um, 
essentially they treat us like an air like an aircraft flight um in fact one time they called us to to tell us to hold while some of the, somebody landed so uh but uh yeah and uh, there may be uh municipal law uh regulations does anyone ever put strobe lights or bright lights leds or something on these at night so that would people look up they see something going by <laughs> Not, not, not since I was in engineering school, uh, and uh, there was a UFO report. But we won't talk any more about that. The one thing I always say is, if you can imagine it, someone has done it. So, I, ever curious. tried to re ever tried a repeater up there? Uh, just a voice repeater, Brett. Yeah, actually, our uh, our last one in June here was a voice VHF voice repeater. It was a store and forward. Um, it only we used a. Uh, a surplus balloon that one of the other hams in Saskatoon donated, and it only got to, uh, I think it was eighty-seven or eighty-two thousand feet. So it uh, it didn't have the coverage we wanted. We, as one of the guys in the state says, uh, anything below a hundred is just practice. So we, we always like to get above a hundred thousand. Uh, yeah. Our highest is one hundred and twenty-five thousand yeah. feet. I I was curious how how many balloon lifts yeah. off would you get out of one uh hydrogen tank uh we use about um two and a half and two thirds of a tank uh for one flight so yeah we can't can't get more than one um out of a flight or one more than one flight out of a tank so your your hydrogen is the most expensive part of your operation uh it can be uh we're actually kind of fortunate um a few years back i was importing balloons from china and uh for hams uh throughout canada and uh rather than mark them up i just got a couple of free balloons out of the deal that was that was my commission on it so the we've been using uh, uh balloons that didn't cost us much if anything uh, up until now but a new balloon um is about a hundred dollars american a party so balloon better. yeah or a latex balloon they're not cheap uh, Bruce, you talked about uh, the regulations. Are there regulations specific to balloons or does it uh, fall under just sort of a general category? There is uh, the regulations, I think are about 600 pages and there is a single paragraph <laughs> that talks about balloons. balloons and okay. it is, and it just talks about the envelope size. So, okay. uh, yeah, uh, if you go over that, you can actually, uh, we looked into that briefly. Um, what you have to do is fly a, a transponder, a regular aircraft transponder, and uh, those start at about two and a half thousand dollars. And how much do they weigh? I mean, never mind the cost. They are tiny now. They were oh. in the hundreds of grams. Uh, okay. They used to be gigantic things, but now they're just tiny little things. Uh, they look That's an awful lot like uh, the DB25 size dongle that used to fit on a computer for something. So yep. about that size or a mm -hmm. spot or uh, what have you. But uh, no, they, uh, we were looking into it because somebody uh, miscalculated. They thought the balloon was going to be way heavier than it was. And uh, they were very glad that when we redid the calculations and that we didn't have to do that because that's, uh, mm -hmm. and a ton of paperwork to go with it if we had to do that. Cool. Thanks. There was a question from Greg. Oh, do you have to beacon to receive a message addressed to you? Uh, yes. So basically what, what I think you're getting at there is for uh, a message to get through um, a local iGate, internet gate, uh, needs to know that, you're, that you exist. So it, it's heard you on, on the air. And then it will actually uh, pass packets that are destined to you through itself, if that makes sense. Bruce, could you say a little bit more about uh, the size and type of battery you're flying? Oh, sure. Um, we are flying. Let's see if I can show on there. Boy, it's black, isn't it? There we are. There's a couple of unused ones. They're just a, a lithium uh, flat pack. <laughs> um, we do also use the cylindrical ones in some of our payloads, the 18650s. But uh, these are a, that's a, a 900 milliamp hour battery in this, this one. Um, 
the little tiny beacon, our uh, tracker, I think is uh, 120 milliamps. So it's it's a tiny little, but it's, uh, um, yeah, most often they're sold, you know, they say they're for RC cars and stuff like that. But oh, you're I talking, if you're, you're, if you're contemplating a, a long flight, like getting it over to Europe or around the world, you kind of have to scale the battery capacity at, with that, right? Uh, yeah, for our long duration ones, um, the only purpose of the battery is to keep it alive overnight. So it goes into a, as low power mode as we can get it and, and still beacons, I think every, every 15 minutes. Um, and if the battery gets too low, it only beacons once an hour. So, and then the solar cells charge the battery up as soon as the sun comes out again. So, uh, yeah, with, uh, the tracker I have here, um, it actually has about 14 hours of battery at room temperature. Uh, the intent there is one time we actually had to go back and find a payload after uh, uh, pretty much at dusk and uh, having your tracker continue to run that long so you can come back and find it is, is a real bonus. I'm surprised that uh, they're not lithium primary cells because those are usually the ones that have the uh, low temperature um low temperature specs uh i have used those as well um and you're right you can uh they go even colder uh but um uh, in the end it was just too fiddly to always make sure we had the right ones and um kind of a it's a trade-off that i ended up mm -hmm. deciding on what's the um uh, strategy for a balloon that does eventually make it across to europe i mean you're following it and you're tracking it but how do you retrieve the package payload you never see it again. You never see it again. <laughs> no. Okay. It doesn't have a little note on it, reward offered or something. <laughs> we we do. Uh, the reward would far outstrip the, <laughs> the cost of the hardware. Um, yeah. If I ever did that, all I'd ask is a picture of, of it with the person that I found it. Um, but the very first fellow, he was in, out of California that made it across, uh, it landed in Algeria. It was the first one that ever made it there. And he eventually got it back, but it cost him a lot of money in bribes and uh, uh, several months of negotiation to get it out of the hands of the person that found it. Well, I'm sure it would create a lot of uh, discussion and concern just, you know, if you find it out in the middle of nowhere, you know, a little bit of electronics beeping. And so there's that uh, hurdle to, to be passed. And let's see, I'm just going to slide this back together, more or less. That's why all of ours... Harmless. They harmless. <laughs> okay, that's good. And telephone number. Uh, that more comes from flying with some of the folks in the States. And that's, if you mark it harmless, you're less likely to have a shotgun blast through the side of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I assume before you launch, you uh, look at the wind um, data, the information as to the high level winds and so on. Um, the, the group that I've, talk to here in Calgary, all kinds of forecasts that they've used. And yet um, it sounds like to me that they're not very reliable. What's your experience? Um, actually, they can be uh, crazy reliable uh, if done correctly. And so I, when we started out, I did it all by hand. Um, and that's uh, not pleasant. And, but um I'm just trying to use the web page. It's called predict.habhub.org. And uh, it does a prediction online for you. This is the one out of Cambridge that's going to uh, be shut down pretty quick. Um, but within 24 hours of a flight, it is uh, crazy accurate. Probably within, it would put us within five kilometers of the real landing zone, unless there's you know something like a, a weather system moving in that dramatically changes things. Um, anything beyond that, um, we've done it as far as a week out, and it's it's just pure fiction then, uh, what it predicts. Uh, there's also one for high altitude, uh, high split, they call it, that does a prediction. And it's, uh, for what it does, it's amazingly accurate, considering it, it predicts around the world days in advance. But uh, yeah, doing it by hand was uh, unpleasant. Like uh, like most hobbies, there's uh, there's always fanatics and there's always competition. 
are there competitions for balloons and ham radio and that sort of thing or uh has it evolved to that yet no you know now that you mention it um i don't think so like it's it's a very cooperative group like if somebody has a question or can't figure something out they the other hams the other people in the ballooning groups they just follow themselves trying to help out and when someone does go 24 times around the world uh everyone although a little envious uh is just <laughs> more than happy about it there's no like let's try to hit the target within so many kilometers or something like that um no it's mostly just um yeah per personal satisfaction it's like us have trying you... to catch the balloon when it comes out of the sky back one of the first comments bruce have you ever had anybody uh call the bob squad on a package that's down <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> we we worry about that on the fox hunts right <laughs> yeah right. and that that's why we put our identification and say harmless ham radio equipment on it so that people aren't uh too nervous to touch it or hit it with a baseball bat and that might be uh might be true in this country but so many other countries boy you don't touch anything that uh is unknown right that's true yeah <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you about that uh, Sabre 31 um, was a repeater uh, back in uh, July. Yes. Because yes. I know um, uh, some uh, people from this group were planning to get together to uh, work with it. Like, uh, did anything happen or just didn't get uh, high enough? <laughs> or... We were there. It was too, it was too shy. <laughs> we scared it away. I can't remember whether you actually heard it or, or not. Well, oh, I, think, I, I think that I actually heard a Morse code beep, but oh, it was okay. so low on the noise scale. I recorded it with my phone uh, for a little while. I could. I was going to ask about that flight, actually, and kind of get some feedback from it, because I, I have a, an image in my mind of what I think happened. But I have this short little recording, but when I play it back, I don't hear the tone. I think it's right out, just outside of the uh, audio range of the filters, you know, on the phone. Oh, okay. But, uh, we, yeah, uh, it we were if, watching it from here and we could we were tracking it on the uh, aprs.fi and we had calculated curvature of the earth how high it needed to be for us to see it mm -hmm. and, and just somewhere just after it reached a high enough altitude that it, we could have heard it so between 17,000 kilometers or 17 kilometers and 23 kilometers we heard a little beep there and um so i think that was it but i i wasn't quite sure what was the equipment was and whether we were, we were expecting a beep and whether that was actually from you or not. So maybe. You right. Can... Um, let me see if I can find a. The other thing that we saw is the track. It was tracking Southeast and then it stopped and it did a 270 degree turn and, and it came back West for a bit. And then we heard it. It was almost like we, yes. it, it sensed us calling for it and it, <laughs> was, it came within range. Right. Yes, actually that is, uh, totally normal and really interesting. Uh, Above the jet stream, the uh, direction of the uh, winds reverse, at least in the summertime. Uh, okay. So it starts traveling to the west again uh, as it ascends. One question I know we had was um, whether or not uh, anyone actually heard us. We may not have heard our uh, signals coming back, but was there anyone there who heard us? Because we did some uh, extended calls on our Yaggies. Oh, okay. Um, to be honest, I haven't really listened through the whole recording. Uh, I don't know if this is going to come through or not through my mic. A little bit more audio in the next. Uh, audio is kind of late. This is Rodney 5RS listening. Okay. Yeah, I think it's so. So I don't, I don't know if that came through or the gist of it. Yeah, we heard it. Yeah. Um, so we heard the, some voice. That's all we heard. Okay. Actually, it is a 24, 24 megabyte, M, 30 megabyte MP3. So um, if anybody can accept that by email, I'll be glad to share it. Or I can post it uh, on our webpage as a, as a link. You can pull it down. Yeah. One other question. Um, I know I had at the time was we do have access to um, Wires X to D Star Echo Link. And we were trying to establish um, from our location to your location uh, ground support to see if you could actually hear us 
transmitting. We were asking, um, was there anybody there who um, had access to any of those type of uh, connections so that we could talk ground to ground to them to see if they could hear us then right. going air to air, you know, back down. Yeah. Uh, I, that was uh, uh, one of the reasons why I asked you about um, Skylink Hub because we do have access through that as well to go right into Saskatoon. Okay. Um, actually, I know there's quite a few hams in town that are, are quite involved with that. I'm not one of them. Um, and I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody was listening at the same time uh, to our balloon or not. Um, for us out in the field, it is, uh, kiosk is uh, an understatement <laughs> for what it's like trying to track this. So uh, yeah, we could barely uh, have time to listen to the actual voice, I suppose, and uh, definitely wouldn't have been able to really get through to anybody. I don't know if you saw any of the uh, pictures of us. We had um, six or so uh, little stations set up, um, and we met on the east side of Calgary at a um, at a park there. But uh, we were all quite anxious to uh, try and and uh, tweak the satellite. <laughs> oh, okay. So we, we'd be more than happy to um, to do that again. Uh, I mean, we were all didn't have a clue what we were doing, but we were all just <laughs> trying everything we could. Well, let, let's see what happens. So it was a lot of fun and we appreciated um, all your guys' efforts as well. Yeah, and, and I guess one thing that we're always looking for is just ways to make it interesting and novel for people. Um, we've flown, we take a lot, I probably have 10 or 15,000 pictures and you know tens of hundreds of hours of video. But uh, yeah, something like this that other hams, especially with ones at a distance, uh, can get involved with it's uh, it's kind of what we're looking for okay that was excellent thank you uh bruce i learned a lot tonight